Oh, we have an Aussie here. Hello. I'm still amazed by the power of Zoom to bring mm. the world, to shrink the world. It just blows me away. I know we're all experiencing a little Zoom fatigue, but it is still just an amazing it thing. It truly is. It truly yeah. is. All right, my friends, it is six o'clock. We're going to get started. Um, I am really excited, as you heard, to have this series um, from this book, um, Reading Reflex and the um, Phonographics Method. And so I reached out to Erin and she kindly agreed to do this. I'm just really excited. So I'm going to give a little background on Erin. She's the CEO of the Phonics uh, Phonographics Reading Company, and she's a linguist, writer, and veteran reading therapist with over 30 years of clinical reading remediation experience. She has taught thousands of clinical hours to students of all ages and challenges, managed classroom literacy instruction and reading assistance projects, and has trained hundreds of teachers, specialists, and parents from around the English-speaking world. Her mission since taking over phonographics in 2014 is to open the door to literacy for everyone through this new paradigm of reading instruction, proven, efficient, multi-sensory instruction based on clinical experience and research in the fields of reading, cognitive psychology, learning theory, child development, motivation theory, and linguistics. And Aaron, I, I didn't realize you thought taught over 30 years because there's no way you look like you could have taught <laughs> that long. So <laughs> when I first met her, I will say this. I, I said, oh, you're young. I thought you were going to be really old. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, um, I present Aaron Duncan. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm very excited to share phonographics with yeah. all of you. Um, let me share my screen. And um, I think that phonographics is going to be perfect for your Facebook group, given that it was created by reading scientists and built up from the ground out of the science of reading. Mm -hmm. So I know that many of you, maybe not all of you, or many of you are very familiar with the science of reading and its tenets. And I think that you'll appreciate seeing how we put those into practice and how you teach someone to read purely from that standpoint. So unless you have questions or anything, I'm just gonna launch into things. How we do it here. <laughs> Perfect. And then at the end, um, we'll all have time where we can do some questions and answers if you have them. Or, well, I assume you have questions and I hope I'll have answers. <laughs> so reading instruction has been on a pendulum for a long time, going back and forth between whole language and phonics, um, probably over 200 years now. Um, driven by the abysmal success rates on either side, they keep pushing us to change. Whole language gets a whole lot right, but it ultimately fails certain kids who need explicit training in the proper mechanics of reading. And phonics attempts to provide that training, but ultimately fails too. And the interesting thing is it fails those same kids. Um, and it's because it gets way too much wrong along the way. Um, the trend currently though is to mix the methods. So whole language or, or a, a, a comprehension focused approach, but then throw in some phonics word work, hoping that the success rates will sort of add on to one another. But mixing isn't working either. The illiteracy rates with this kind of approach are still you know, 40 to 50%. So the authors of phonographics realized, along with other reading scientists, that we, we need a fundamental rethinking of what we teach, and in particular, of how we teach it. So in 1993, the authors of phonographics conducted an experiment. They started from the ground up, and they said, well, let's see what good readers and spellers are actually doing. 
what are the causative correlates to better reading? Um, and what will happen if we teach that and only that and do so in keeping with research and theory of how children learn and um, make parents partners in the instruction too. So, there we go. So the developers of phonographics really started from scratch and they said, let's just put together what the research from multiple fields of inquiry, inquiry tell us and integrate that with extensive clinical experience and clinical trials with kids to see what happens with, with as you try um, different approaches with students and see which ones ha have the best practices. And the results of their experiment were um, published in the Orton Annals, which is of course the research journal for the International Dyslexia Society. And they found that 98% of their students were reading real words at grade level in an average of 12 clinical hour long sessions. Um, each of those section, sessions included 45 minutes of review work that was done in between. Phonographics was purposefully made simple enough for parents to work in partnership. So the review work was done at home using the support materials that go along with the method uh, for a clinical and classroom instruction. These are really phenomenal success rates. There's only one other program that I'm aware of that can do this, you know, 98% do it this far. And that takes 80 to 100 hours um, instead of 12. And I invite you to visit the Phonographics website. You'll find a section of research and you'll see some of the other findings, of course, that um, have been um, determined for phonographics. But one thing I wanna point out is that phonographics can actually reach the kids with the most severe phonological processing needs. And it does it six times faster than other methods in the, in the literature. But the biggest finding, of course, is the effect on the brain. Um, this is why phonographics can reach those kids with the severe phonological processing problems because it's rewiring the brain. It's not just phonics activities, it's cognitive reading therapy and it brings about permanent changes in the brain. So how do we bring this about? Well, we simply train the mechanics of reading but we do it in the process as the students are reading. So it's just like learning to ride a bike. You do it on a bike. Well, here we do it with books. So we guide students to use the proper strategies and neural networks right when and where they're going to be doing so when they're fluent. So nothing is done as preparation to learn to read. We even teach the information they're going to need, you know, the sound symbol correspondences right in the process too. So there's no drilling, drilling, drilling of skills or information ahead of time that later must be get transferred to the book. Um, something that some students have a, a great deal of difficulty doing on their own. Um, and besides it, it saves a ton of time if you do it this way. Um, and we get to keep the joy of reading. Um, we get into real literature as soon as possible, um, learning to ride the bike. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one of our main goals is to provide enough skills and accurate information to get students right into books. And then we're gonna train the rest there. And because every child is different, different experiences, different talents, interests, different challenges, different learning styles, different curricula at school, different home environments, phonographics instructors are taught to do their training in any literature and taught to capitalize on the teachable moments through careful error correction techniques based on direct feedback. And you know, our second goal is to get them decoding as quickly as possible so that students aren't missing out on years of reading that's needed for building language comprehension. This second one is more profound than I think most of us realize. We're, we're now coming to see that decoding delays lead to profound inequities in our educational system. So we want to get students reading quickly as possible. So what is it that we provide 
to get students into books. Well, remember that the phonographics experiment was to identify what good readers and spellers are doing fluently and usually unconsciously, and to train this and only this. So we train students to do each thing at the proper point in the reading or spelling process, targeting the correct parts of the brain at the correct times. So one of the first things we do is we teach three phonological skills, the ones that in the literature when they started the experiment were found to be causative correlates to better reading. Now phonics programs these days are teaching phonemic and phonological skills, but with hugely varying success. So the question we need to ask is which ones are they teaching? And critically, how are they taught and when? In phonographics, these are always done right when good readers and spellers are engaging those skills, not taught in isolated drills, then leaving it up to the student to transfer the skills to print on their own. So we start by having, we start, we don't do anything else. We start by having kids spell words and we train them to segment sounds as they do it. And we'll teach the sound symbols they need to know for the word as needed. We also have them read the, the converse of it by teaching them any symbols they don't know as they try it out, blending them, training them to blend the sounds, the spoken sounds together as they work through the word. And we simply keep this up, reading and spelling words, employing the phonological skills when needed um, until kids are pro, uh, fluent and automatic at employing those skills and until they know enough of the sound symbols to uh, continue on their own. We start with very simple words and work our way up through more and more complex ones, uh, jumping back and forth between single words and connected text in a research-based and clinically tested sequence. So looking at the complexity of the words as it increases, we teach the logic of the, our written code. Good readers and spellers have a, an understanding of, of our written system, albeit an unconscious, maybe intuitive one usually. And our written code is surprisingly logical if you look at it in a different way than we have in the past. The problem is phonics always looks at it backwards. It starts from letters and tries to explain the letters crazy behavior. Uh, that makes for a ton of rules with even more exceptions than cases that hold true, it seems. And ultimately ends with a whole lot of word memorization and guessing. So where phonics attempts to set out rules explaining the chaos, phonographic simply mapped it, analyzed thousands and thousands of words and figured out what readers and spellers need to know and do in order to read it. So this is our paradigm shift, you know, that our written code was made to record words by sounds. And when we start our instruction from the sound and keep true to that all the way through, things really fall into place for students. And it, it, it's logical and understandable. So phonographics presents sounds and words and connected text in a careful sequence designed to reveal the logic of our written code. And importantly, using language that is understandable to even very young students or those with special learning challenges. So phonographics really gives us a blueprint for literacy. It's what we provide students to get them into a book and what we train them to use each and every time they encounter print. It's a stunningly simple set of four ideas and three skills that when trained as cleanly and clearly as possible in keeping with the science of how children learn, attains 98% efficacy in a very little time. A critical piece here, however, is how children learn. And that's a, another piece of the phonographics puzzle that is just as important as what we teach, I would say. One thing we need to realize is children are very concrete. They need developmentally appropriate instruction. They learn best when information is provided to them in its proper context and made relevant first. Uh, 
And they learn better through identification, not rule, you know, based in discovery. And the phonics tradition we've inherited is, is really far from this. I want you to reflect for a moment on how in concrete the language of all the phonics rules is. We have two vowels walking, um, which is not meant concretely. Uh, we have silent or magic ease, jumping over, making things say their name. Uh, we have hard G's that aren't hard in the literal sense. We have soft G's, we have long vowels and short vowels. The inconcreteness makes it quite difficult for many, many kids. Further, these rules are in something that we call propositional logic. It's not developmentally appropriate until age nine or so, if then. So phonographic system presents everything from start to finish using concrete language instead. It's a truly different approach, not just phonics in another package. It's a phonetic linguistic approach built from the ground up on solid science, revealing a simple logical code presented so that every student can grasp it. As we move forward though, I, I would like for us to keep in mind that there's three types of students that we're going to be encountering. One type, just needs an explanation of the code and, and to see how good readers and spellers manage it and they take off. About 75% of the population can naturally work with sounds accurately and this is all they need. But the other 25% need to be taught explicitly to work with sounds. And most phonics programs don't teach that well enough at all. So a second type of student is gonna need additional small group lessons that will focus on building the skills that the others have naturally. And the third type, our lowest 10%, have severe phonological processing issues. They need significantly more of that instruction. But importantly, they need the same instruction as the others. They just need this additional time, um, probably in very small groups or one-on-one -on -one to help train that. Phonographics has a quick assessment that will allow you to identify your students' needs and to drive instruction for all of these types. So let's look at what we do to help students crack this code. Let's look at the logic of our written system, what good readers have internalized, and how the three phonological skills are engaged to sort that out and to work with it. So as we move forward, remember that phonographics simply analyze thousands and thousands of words to map out how they work and what you need to do to read or to spell them. And this next piece is the result. So the, the logic of our code is what we need to explain to all three types of students in our classroom. And it boils down to four simple concepts. These concepts are those though that, phono that phonics actually obscures in its complexity and it's print to speech mapping. So the first concept is that letters are pictures of sounds. Each sound we speak is, is shown through figures that we call letters. So this thing right here doo -doo -doo -doo, is actually three pictures, a picture of the sounds k and a and t. And this is what it means to be phonetic. It's a simple concept. But in order to understand this, learners must be able to accurately segment sounds. So that's the first of the phonological skills that we're going to work with and why we need it. They need this so they can notice which letter or letters represent the sounds that they're hearing accurately. And to use a sound picture code like this, readers have to be able to blend isolated sounds into meaningful words. So that's the second skill that we need to build. Uh, this shouldn't be surprising to you, of course. Any phonics program these days is working with simple words in this way. But I do want to make a note about segmentation. Although it tends to be taught in phonics, it's constantly being undermined in most reading instruction models with a focus on word families, which are multiple sounds, onset and rhyme, which are groups of sounds again, blends, groups of sounds, R controlled vowels. All of these things are obscuring 
the pure segmentation skill that students need to be really good with. True segmentation to the, phono, to the phoneme level is crucial to, and the key to cracking the code. And the interesting thing is students can all learn to segment. The even deaf students are being taught to segment phonemes using phonographics. But inaccuracy with segmenting is why some of your older students never got that first concept that English is phonetic. And they just look at words as either known or not known with no idea that they can be decoded or at least no attempt to do so in, in their habits when they're working alone. So one of our first challenges is to teach segmenting to kids and teach it very well. But segmenting can be a challenge. Asking a child to isolate and sequence a fleeting sound, it's a temporal challenge. You know, sounds are in time and they come and go quickly. And young children don't manage temporal challenges very well. So the use of numbers on the board that you'll see in a second, as devised by the authors of the method, Carmen and Jeffrey McGinnis, is a spatial challenge, something that young children are very good at. So I'm going to show you a quick lesson demonstration on how we teach segmenting through word building and how we do that with numbers on the board. Um, building words should be pretty familiar. I think almost every program is doing that kind of thing now. But I want you to note what you don't see here. You're not going to see any letter names coming from the teacher. You're not going to see extraneous language. You're not going to see keywords or other mnemonics. Instead, we train an unsullied automatic response of sound to print. So I'll be quiet and let you watch. We're gonna build some words. So I'm gonna give you a board. Just that in a second. That is extra. We're going to build the word cat, another word for hat. So we're going to go cat. Okay. So, what is the first sound you hear in cat? Oh, and the next sound? Um, good. Say the sounds with me again. Very good. All right, now you can write that one. Don't forget, you're going to say each sound is right, right? Um, there you go. Can you underline each sound for me? There you go. Fix that one. Ready for another one? languages, this first concept that letters are pictures of sounds, along with segmenting and blending, 
are all you need. But our written system is more complex. You need to understand more to see its phonetic nature and to follow through all the way with a sound to print approach. So the second concept that we teach to kids is that some of these sound pictures are more than one letter. Just a simple, clear concept. So this right here is three symbols of the three sounds in the word boat, b and o and t. And one of those symbols happens to be more than one letter. Now, can children understand this? Well, they can, if they can understand that this is a square, this is a triangle, but this is a house. Yes, they have the same components, but they've been put together into something completely new, reassessed into a new single thing. And that's the way we wanna treat our, um, our sound pictures. So the developers of phonographics wanted to be sure that this logic was accessible to young kids. They asked 40 very young kids, four, five, and six-year-olds, what these were, square, triangle, house. Not one of those young children couldn't tell them. They learned, I, they assumed from contra, context and active discovery, you know, this doesn't really look like a house, but <laughs> somehow that's what all the children wanted to say. Not one of those kids needed a rule for why a triangle on a square is a house. They don't need that. We don't think that way about visual figures in the world. In fact, children assess and combine visual figures in the world every day. So we can treat them the same. We can have them assess and combine letters and do it in the same way with the same language and the same logic where this can be ah, uh, this can be ah, uh, but this new thing is a completely other thing. It's O. Oh. So here's a quick demonstration video of how we might begin working with this concept that sound pictures can be longer with a young student. We're building lessons that are a lot like this, where you might take the word fish and ask them, this, these aren't the materials, but look how adaptable it is. I can just take this and use it for it instead. We can do just what we were doing before. Um, and you can build words that have these longer sound pictures in there. So you could say, you wouldn't want to have fish on there. You just want to say, let's build fish. What's the first sound you hear in fish? I'm going to grab it and bring it in. Great, now what sound do you hear here? In fish. Yeah. Yeah, good. And what sound do you hear right here? Fish. Fish. Shh. Exactly, and that's how I could teach her what sh is. I don't have to tell her anything. This shows her that sound pictures can be more than one letter. And when we read them, we go like this. Fish, fish, beautiful. So that would be the advanced code word building that you could do. Um, another so that's a second concept. Oops, our third concept is that there's something called variation in the code. All of our sounds have more than one spelling. So here is an example of the sound O and some of the common ways that we spell it. Um, we have a bunch that are that look like this and we have a, a whole bunch that look like that and a whole bunch that look like this and a whole bunch that look like this. And the interesting thing is this variation is not just a quirk of a few vowel sounds like some case with a few exceptions. It is the very nature of our written code. When you analyze thousands and thousands of words and lay them out, you're gonna see that every one of our sounds is shown in multiple ways. Um, so here are the, is the chart that the McGinnises, the authors of the method developed for the vowel sounds of English. You'll see a, a box for every single sound. So this is the box for the sound O and all the regularly recurring ways that we show this sound. Ow has three different ways. Er has all of these ways. E has a bunch, look at that. 
The interesting thing is it's not complete chaos. Every sound has a finite and actually quite discrete set of regularly recurring sound pictures. Uh, so when you put it all together, you'll see that our spoken language has about 44 sounds, but our written code is made up of 144 consistently recurring ways to represent each of those sounds. And virtually all of our spoken words, um, here's a low estimate from, from linguists of how many words we, we're using all the time, about 20,000 spoken words. Um, virtually all of them are written with this set of, a, of 144 sound pictures. There are maybe 50 to 100 words that don't easily fit, um, that aren't easily decodable with those sound pictures. Um, but they can be learned through exposure in print and shouldn't be our focus. We really want to go for the 19,900 other words. That's where our focus needs to be, not on the strange exceptions. Now, children can, can children learn these 144 sound pictures? Well, yes, they can. And if we keep it clear and simple, they can learn these paired associates quite readily as long as we're tapping into their natural language learning process. Children learn the names of things around them quite naturally. Even those with very low IQs uh, learn the names of things that they encounter regularly. They just need to be surrounded by these and, and, and not derailed from understanding them. Now, what about the fact that there are multiple ways to show each sound? Can children understand this? Well, they can, if they can understand that this is a flower, this is a flower, and this is a flower. They may all look different, but they share the same label. The logic behind this concept of variation is simple and completely teachable to even very young students. So again, the, the developers of phonographics actually studied this with that same test group of four to six year olds, and none of them had trouble with the, this idea of flowers sharing um, a label, but looking different. So they can all understand that O might look differently at times. So here is just a peek at how we might present this to students of all ages. The discovery reading and mapping lesson has different presentations you might do. I'm just showing you one that's nice for the classroom okay. and also nice for students with visual processing issues. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll find it in the resource materials from the from the McGinnis is the program developers. Um, but essentially you start with a word, you have a student read it. So you could go around the classroom having different students read it or you could read it chorally, however you like. Diana, what word do we have there? Mm -hmm. Neat. Neat. And then you would invite the student to find a spot for that word. You put it on the cover of the magic or does it not matter? Doesn't matter, wherever they want to put it. And um, learning theory and motivation theory um, that's built into the program mm -hmm. um, tells us that making subjective choices, you know, choosing the color you want to put it in, engages students more. And the more they're engaged, the more they learn. Okay. So it's always nice to set up situations like that. Okay. Great. So when we read this word, we said E right here. So this is one of the pictures of E. But I don't know if you know this, but there are other ones. So as we read them, if they have this way to do E, we'll put it where Diana had picked. If they have a different way to do E, we'll, we'll put them in a different circle. All right, so let's have somebody read this. Read you on a turn. <laughs> reading words and sorting them. I could just ask the whole class to read the word with me. Say, all right, let's read this one. E, chi, and pull, you know, allow some child to decide where they're gonna put it. Um, and they're supposed to put chief with field because it's got the same way to do E, right? And we'd read happy and somebody would be excited to get to put it in blue, right? And we'd read bunny and that would end up there. and me and we'd have to see oh it doesn't go there does it 
it's not the same. And I have to show that to some students amazingly mm -hmm. uh, and decide we need a new spot for that and for cream. Oh, we don't have that one either, do we? And meat, and we could discuss what kind of meat that is, of course. And valley. And key. And penny. And he. We. Eat. Now, what do you do when you have, when you're doing this lesson and you have to have something that has like 10 different ways to make the sound? Because this chart only has seven. Do you just do seven? The most one? common ones. Okay. Exactly. And when you're working with the little ones, maybe you don't want to do all 10. Maybe right. you want to do the three or four that okay. they're going to see the most. Okay. And if you ever do get certified, the certification kit has a word lists that are already called down for you for that great, those great introductory levels. levels for the kindergarten levels and things like that. That's great. And you'll see this, imagine this um, presentation um, has the has it called down already for you too. Right. Because there are more ways to do right. e. there's 10 ways for e. 10 ways to do five, five. Yeah. or six. six and we didn't do very many words. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't get too overwhelming. But this gives students a, a, a very nice visual picture of variation in our right. in our code. And for once they're seeing all the variations of a single sound on the same day. Right. I mean, yes, we have been teaching these, right? And these and these, but we might do this one week, this five weeks later, mm -hmm. this at the end of the year, along with something else. And students never learn to put these all together as representing the same sound. Mm -hmm. So that's the concept of variation and how we might present it to a student. Now to manage this concept, we have to teach students further. We use lessons like sound search that I'm gonna show you in a second to train readers to notice the accepted spellings of words that you know, we have many ways to spell a sound but each word has one accepted way and we need to notice that. And then we have lessons like scratch sheet spelling to um, to show readers or spellers how to rely on recognition, not expressive memory for spelling. So let me show you those two very quickly. So you can use any story that you like, beautiful literature, whatever you're already using in your classroom. Uh, there are a few stories that are, uh, that are included in the books um, that you could use for this too. So here's just a silly story called Blue the Moose. And if I were doing this for a sound search, we would have read this story already, focused on what it means, enjoyed the story. Um, and then this would be a separate word work type of lesson that I would be with them. Say, remember Diana, we read Blue the Moose yesterday? Mm -hmm. You probably noticed there were a lot of oohs. Mm -hmm. So let's go through and find them. Here. Um, just read, and as you find a word with ooh, just underline it. There was, there was once a moose named Lou. Lou was very young and quite new. He loved to go to the zoo. Oh, good. You skipped two, though. There, I mean, oh. there's some words with ooh in there. He loved to mm -hmm. go to the zoo. Those are easy to skip. Uh -huh. He ate cotton candy and bought balloons and sat up top with a goose. Now Lou never knew it till June that next year he was off to school. That's a tricky one, school. I guess it's a new school. It is, it is. I can't That's do it. Okay. People can get the idea. Now this one's a little tricky because it kind of blends into the L, so it's not as pure of an U. Exactly, school. so students will skip a lot and you just help them to know there, there are more in there. And students will also underline something like top. Uh, because it looks like, you know, like the ooh in right. two, go, mm -hmm. right? And then I would have to say, oh, you know, I think you got tricked by your eyes. If that were an ooh, our word would be two. Mm -hmm. And they'll laugh and go, oh, no, that's off. You say, that's right, we don't want to underline that one. So this one is a wonderful way to work with 
both the variation and the oo sound, because as we do this, we're going to see many ways to spell the oo sound, as well as confronting the concept of overlap that we're going to look at next. And if younger kids, you would read it. For correct? younger kids, I would read it. And in a classroom, I could read it, and all the kids could cry when they heard an oo sound. Right. It's very fun. Or, you know, some other method. Uh, or we could work with simpler stories as well. Okay. Um, and then another part of this lesson is to take these words that you found and look at the spelling of the oo sound within that particular word. So I would have the student take the word. Let's take that first word. What do you have there, Diana? Moose. Moose. So let's map that over here. And the method talks about mapping and the importance of having the student say the sound as they write. You saw, she saw that in my classroom. They don't always like to say this. They sound. don't like to do it because it's important. It's bringing a lot of things right. together. They're, they're seeing, hearing, saying, forming. Uh, it's a very powerful, powerful technique. And it's difficult to integrate all of those things together for some students. You know, we, I know we're becoming more aware of brain issues in kids and difficulties of crossing the midline and mm -hmm. doing, doing cross brain activities. And oh my goodness, is writing one of those. You necessarily have to do bilateral work there where you're working with the sound, which is in one part of the brain with what you're seeing and forming in another part of the brain. A lot to put together, so no wonder it's hard, but right. we practice it and we'll get better and better. Mm -hmm. So, now about moose, right here, watch your method, it's sort of big for the picture, maybe if they can see. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, and over here, show me the spelling of ooh, this and moose. Very nice. And let's do another one, let's do loo. Oh, ooh. And ooh for loo. We're literally showing them what to attend to, which ooh is in loo, which ooh is in moose. And I think we get a very different picture of variation in this lesson. Because when we sort them all out on the chart, the student's reaction, I think, is, my goodness, there's a lot of ways to do ooh. And when we do this, their reaction is, oh, it's that ooh again. Oh, it's this ooh again where it seems more knowable and more finite, I think. Mm -hmm. Because so, in context, mm -hmm. right. Very powerful lesson. So that's how we train them to notice the accepted spellings. And then we use the next lesson to have them then find those accepted spellings on their own. We have a lesson like scratchy spelling to show readers how to rely on recognition to be a better speller rather than trying to express out every spelling of every word, which is an impossible task. Mm -hmm. What good spellers really do, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to make you spell the word insidiousness. Insidiousness. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Who's wanting to grab their pencil okay. and, and try it out, right? And look at one version and another version and decide. We good spellers are doing that constantly, jotting things down and seeing which one they so which one looks right. Looks right. Mm -hmm. So that's the process we need to teach kids to do. So a lesson like scratchy spelling does that. Mm -hmm. So I could say to Diana, let's play a little spelling game. We were reading Lou the Moose and we saw different ways to do ooh, different ways. What else do we have with that one? Any other ones you remember? Oh, like this one. Right, and we could look at the sheet and fill right. it out if we want to. But you know, it's it's not about memorizing what it can be. It's about the process of spelling. Right. Okay. So I'm going to give you a word. I'm gonna, hopefully, I can find one you don't know how to spell right away, okay. and show you how to figure it out. So let's take the word, and I could pull it from the story if I want to. Right. Um, let's take the word new, like a new car. Do you yeah. happen to know which one it is? Do you have a guess? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and put it where you think it might be. Map it out. Mm. Ooh. Excellent. Now, think about anything else you think might look good. And let's map it another way, just to compare. Mm. Ooh. All right, what do you think? One of those looks better? That one looks better. 
I almost said it for a little line for that one because we don't think that one's good. Are there any other ones you want to try out? Because we have when I try that, it'll be no. See, that's an advanced student. Uh, another student might not, might want to write it out and I might tell them, well, that's Maybe no. Because no. that's spells the sense as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Does that one look better or does that one look better? I still think that one. Okay, so cross that one out. What if I didn't know? What if I said that one looked better? I would tell them, um, you know, this makes complete sense. This spells the sounds of new, and that could have been the one that they picked. But a long time ago, everyone decided we would just spell every word the same way, even though we have so many options. Um, and they just picked spelling. Mm -hmm. And that could have been the one they picked, but it isn't. Let's check in the story and see which one they picked. So we want to look back. You know, this is a great way for them to verify and, the word new. and find the word new. And they go, oh, it's that one. Right. And I say, yeah, yeah, it's that one. Why don't you circle the one that it is? Mm -hmm. Great. And say, but you did the first step beautifully, which is to write the sounds and write something that works for what you hear. And you'll get, as you read and notice the sound pictures more, you'll get better and better at finding the one that you remember seeing. So let's try another one. So that's how we work with variation and teach kids to manage that. Um, but the fourth concept that we need to impart is something called overlap. There's where sound pictures can represent more than one sound. Um, the letters OW, for example, can be the sound O as in grow or the sound OW as in cow, just as often. Uh, the letters EA re regularly represent three different sounds, as you can see in the word steak versus bread versus eat. This is a robust feature of our written code. It occurs over and over and over again. It simply isn't true that the letters OW represent the sound OW. This symbol represents either O or OW. And EA represents either E, A, or E. It happens over and over and over again. It's a regularly recurring aspect of our written system. Most of the exceptions that you're gonna to find to the phonics rules are simply cases of overlap. So can children understand this concept? Well, they can if they can understand that this is a ball or a moon, okay? How many things, how many things can you think of that that might be? You can probably come up with a lot of them if I've made you sit and think about it. Uh, when the authors of the method worked with the very young kids to test out these logics and see if they were accessible to them, on average, those students generated six different things that might be. Children manage overlap in visual images in the world around us all the time. They can manage that the letters OW can be O in brown, in brown or OW in, <laughs> I'm sorry, can be ow in brown or o in grown, right? And to manage the overlap in our code, we find that readers just simply try out the options and use meaning to choose. So if they hadn't seen this word before, but they know what this can be, they might think, is it steak? Is it steak? No, it's steak. Steak is meaningful. I'm going to pick that one, right? But to do this, readers must be able to accurately manipulate sounds in words to change steak to steak to steak, right? This is a third skill, phony manipulation. That's the one that I was saying we'd get to at some point. And that's the third one that we train in the phonographics program. And we want to be sure that we teach that skill right where it's employed by good readers, which is to manage overlap. And we want to be sure that readers know that they need to look further into the context at times. Uh, if they don't know this word and they're trying to sound it out, it might be tone, it might be town, both of them are meaningful. But in the bigger context, only one is going to work. Our tone is a great place to live. No, our town is a great place to live. So this is another reason we can't divorce decoding instruction from connected text. Interestingly, the concept of overlap in traditional phonics looks completely different. 
I mean, this is where we have all these rules like hard and soft G's and all their exceptions, right? Uh, we have long vowels to explain why sometimes this is you, sometimes this is a, uh, but then we have no explanation for words like put where it's uh, or oo where it's super, or super where it's oo. We try to have, look at open syllables and closed syllables, but then bobbins and robins have the same sounds, but don't have the same spellings. It's, it's, it's pretty chaotic. Uh, letters just simply won't behave as all these rules want them to. And the problem is when encountering these exceptions, students are left with nothing to rely on. They only have guessing and whole word memorization at this point. And I want to make a side note about the rules. Even if the rules did hold true here, we really wouldn't want to use those to teach kids, not to teach them. Right? Kids don't learn best via rule, but they learn best via discovery. And more importantly, we don't want them stopping the decoding process to think about a rule. We want fluent left to right processing of the symbols into sounds and those sounds into blended words. And using these rules is going to trigger the wrong parts of the brain and slow that process down. So how do we address that overlap in phonographics? The, what well, we teach, just the concept that sound pictures can represent more than one sound. And we simply teach the child to then try the options and choose what makes sense. And of course, we need to make sure to build the phoneme manipulation skill well enough to allow a student to be successful with this. So, um, here, I was going to show you a quick example of how we might teach overlap with a student. Um, and I'm hoping we still have time. Looks like we do. Where we take, um, take sound pictures, like the one that we discussed earlier, that can represent different sounds and practice sorting it into groups based on the sound it represents in that word. OK, so read that one, Diana, what do we have? Um, the, what if I said the, because it could be uh, eat. I think what else that could be. Like in bread, it says B R E A. What if I thought it was fetch? Fetch. Yeah. Because actually, when you had it covered, I thought it was bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So and you, you uncovered it. I'm like, oh, wait a second. So yeah, what if I stuck with that? But then you uncovered it. I'm like, okay, it's beach. But what if I said fetch? Mm -hmm. And you would say, maybe. What would I'd say, but fetch isn't a word. Right? Okay. So then I have to try something else. But do you know what to do? And I would ask her, do you know what to do when that happens? Because you sounded it out. That, that could be bo, that can be and that can be ch. But it didn't make a word. Do you know what to do? Okay. The beach. I would tell her that's when you need to try a different sound sometimes. Right. This one can be eh, but it, it represents another sound or two as well. Do okay. you know what else it can be? If she doesn't, then I can tell her. Okay. It can be A and it can be E. Try one of those. The H, H, the each, each, each. Each makes sense. Yeah, each is the only one that makes sense. So we're yeah. going to know which one it is in this word. So what sound is this in this word? E. E. So let's put the ones that end up E, E, E over here. Okay. Let's read another one. There's what I thought the first one was. The, er, ed, bread. It's bread. So what sound is this? Eh, eh. So we said that was E. Let's put the ed ones there. Yeah. Mm. Etch, H, each, each. Teach. Very nice. And basically, as a teacher, I just put things down and see what happens. Let them try the different sounds. Yeah, and then guide with the correct error corrections. Right. That makes when, sense. when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would show you more, but I, I know time's running short. So um, this next lesson, I was going to show you a quick demonstration of how we train the phony manipulation skill. Um, I, I think it would be um, interesting for you to see. To build a word for me. And make sure you say each sound as you pull the sound picture down, okay? The first one is hot. 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 
the word we were looking for was caught. Caught. So there you go. So let's do the sound again. Caught. Good. So we'll keep that one down here. And now we want to go from caught to pot. So what do you have to do to change that to pot? So now we have. What's the first sound? Uh, uh, Very good. How about from pot to cat? Good. Um, Very good. How about from cat to bat? Um, So that's just a taste of how we work with the phoneme manipulation skill. Of course, that's at an early stage and we work with that skill with more and more complex words as we move along in the program. Um, but altogether, what we've been looking at gives us our the blueprint for literacy for phonographics. We have four simple concepts of what readers have to know that letters are pictures of sound, sound pictures are more than one, can be more than one letter. There's more than one way to show each sound and some of those sound pictures are represented or, or are used to represent more than one sound at a time. And the three skills that good readers and spellers are using, engaging to sort this all out, um, the segmenting, blending and phoneme manipulation skills. This is what readers can use to crack the code. Um, in phonographics, we teach this, and that's all we teach. And the experiment was amazing that they could come out with such an efficacy rate with these simple concepts and skills. But the important thing, remember, is that we're doing this in keeping with how children learn, that we're doing it always with concrete language, developmentally appropriate lessons. The information is always in the context it's going to be used and made relevant first before it's provided. And that we teach kids through discovery and not rules. So that's the blueprint for phonographics. Um, but I do want you to um, think about the fact, too, that phonographics isn't just a set of lessons. It really requires a fundamental shift in, in teaching as well. The lessons are designed to bring up errors because these are the teachable moments. And most of the instruction is actually accomplished through careful response to errors. So that's a big part of the training and the, and the materials um, to help you learn to do that method better. There's much more to it. There's an entire multisyllable level. It has the same logical, developmentally appropriate approach. Um, there's a diagnostic component for focusing the instruction on children's particular needs and for grouping kids in, in a classroom. And there are a lot of resources available nowadays. There's parent support books and worksheets that go along every, with every level. Um, an extended student manual that I'm currently reviewing or revising, it's gonna be coming out again very soon for those who need additional practice or help applying what they've learned. There's a, a teen or adult literacy kit um, and decodable and especially decoded books and, and such. Um, I had planned to show you a bit of the multisyllable level, uh, but I think we're running short on time. Maybe we'll save that in case someone has a question and really wants to see it, we can come back to it. Um, but I wanted to point out that phonographics is presented in various formats. Um, you'll find it, it particularly in the Reading Reflex book, I think will be interesting for all of you. It was a book written for parents and it gives them everything they need to teach their own child at home. Um, and 
although the method is written in clinical and classroom formats and we have training for instructors and, and educators, um, I think the Reading Reflex book is a great way to get started, even for educators. Um, it's a way to try out the method before you decide you want to pursue further training or something like that. So for that reason, um, we'll be doing a book study of Reading Reflex, that book, starting in February um, through the Science of Reading Facebook page. And I, I invite parents to come and so that you can learn to um, teach your child at home with, some, with confidence using the science of reading or teachers. Um, you can test out the method with a, a struggling student or a group of students and see what you think. Uh, administrators give you a chance to examine this powerful and affordable instructional model. So I invite you to explore the method and the research behind it at our website, which is phonographics.com. And you'll also find the store there uh, where you could purchase Reading Reflex if you want to, um, to get ready for the, for the book study. Um, and I highly recommend one of our home instruction starter kits if you're going to do that. Um, it includes the book, Reading Reflex, and it has a great accessory package that goes along with it. So I've given a, a coupon code for you guys. And there's also a coupon code for your group to use for the online certification course if anybody wants to do it. And I think we'll talk more about that during the book study. All right, so I am going to stop sharing this and come back to all of you and to Donna. Donna, I think has been monitoring the chat and was going to moderate the question and answer session. So when we hop into that before everybody goes off to dinner. Okie dokie, here we go. Um, so someone asked, is this designed for use in tier one? Yes, absolutely. So as I, if you may recall the slide where I had the three different types of students, the type one is your tier one instu student. And we, um, of course, work with those students and show them the nature of the code. We fill in holes and gaps for them and make sure they're using the correct skills, uh, but they can be very quickly worked with and can um, make amazing gains in a very short amount of time. I, I agree. I've, I've heard that. I mean, I think there's an assumption that we have to go very, very slowly, but for the typical learner, they can quickly learn this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another one. I've read the book. I like the program. I'm considering using it with a severely dyslexic elderly student. However, I have one reservation about using the program. In the advanced code section on page 231, five graphemes for long O are taught at the same time. Doesn't it introduced too many graphemes at one time. How does a struggling reader with long-term memory and memory recall issues handle this barrage of graphemes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's very interesting. That is part of this paradigm shift. If we're setting up sound as a category, right? A real thing in natural language that students have access to, then we want to show them how that sound is represented. Um, and in the past, we always thought, oh, it would be too confusing to show them all too many things at once, but give it a try. And you're going to see that actually students have been encountering all this chaos out there. And for once, this is finally putting things into discrete categories and something that's understandable and knowable. Um, and in the lesson, you know, we make it clear that we're not trying to memorize all these sound pictures. I'm not trying to get them to regurgitate that chart to me. I want them to sit instead set up a category in their mind for O, like a branch on a tree, and they have a place to put the information as they encounter it now. So from our first experience, they're going to see, oh, there are multiple ways to do O, right? They may not remember them all. They may only remember one or two. That's fine. As they read and experience more, they're going to come across more O's, and they're going to have a place in their mind to file that information, a tree with a place to put that, that leaf of that new information that comes. Okay, uh, this is from Dr. Tim Rosinski. If individual letters are pictures of sounds, why can't word families, phonograms, rhymes, 
Uh, can that also be considered pictures of sounds? Seems that processing words by rhymes is much more efficient processing of words. Hmm. Yes, but when you work with a rhyme, you're working with a group of sounds. You're not working with a single sound. Mm -hmm. So if you're working with on, let's say, there are two sounds there. And if you don't train the student to segment those, then there's never going to be able to figure out what aw can be and what n can be separately. Mm -hmm. Never going to be able to pin down what, how the sounds are shown by our sound pictures. Um, and you're really upping the number of things that the student needs to memorize. It's, it's quite inefficient, in fact. You take 144 sound pictures and you turn them into over 1,200 things, that 1,200 symbols that you're going to need to remember which is way too much of a load. And I'm not sure teaching by rhyme is transferring to spelling. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a different approach. This is, this is a speech to print approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. With older kids, let's see, I think it can work. Um, oh, someone asked, can this be used in a larger group or just small group? Um, it seems it was all individual. Yeah, I was demonstrating the individual just to make it easier for everyone to see, but um, we, we use this method whole group um, for tier one instruction in the classroom. And there's a manual that's written specifically for that with the lesson plans. Um, we also use it in small groups and there are lesson plans for that or individually. Um, so, um, we're able to cover tier one instruction as well as tier two and tier three instruction with the, with the different um, instructional manuals that you'll, you would encounter in the, in the training. Uh, how does the discovery method work with students with low English language skills or, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, folks that are deaf or um, hearing have hearing loss? Uh, well, when you present students with some data and you give them a way to sort that out, then they will discover for themselves the patterns. Humans are natural pattern seekers. Mm -hmm. So whether they can put it into language or not for you, they're going to see the patterns there and be working with them. Um, so I find it much, much easier to give a student a whole set of O words and let them sort them into groups and see what they see the patterns that they discover and that they can see as they do that much easier than trying to explain a rule to somebody who is um, who is challenged by listening to the language and, and breaking down all the all the instruction. So this discovery mode is actually much easier for them than you than any other mode. And there was another question about discovery. I'm curious about the statement that children learn best through discovery. What about evidence for explicit instruction? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, there is explicit. We have to think about what we teach explicitly and what patterns we allow them to, to figure out. So um, it's, it's interesting. You know, People want to impart a, a rule, for example, and they want to teach the child through the rule. But one thing you'll find is if you teach the kids how to, how to process the words, and then you give them the, the, a set of words with the pattern you want them to see, they will tell you the rule. And then they're going to know it much, much better than if you had taught them the rule and said, OK, look at how it, how it plays out with this set of words. Um, so I think what we need to think about is what we're going to teach explicitly. You know, there is explicit instruction, right? And we teach explicitly how to, how to break down a word, how to process it, how to, how to move through it correctly, but maybe not explicitly on, on a phonics rule. Does that make sense? I, I think it's explicit. I think you're teaching those sounds, but the discovery comes through where they have to determine where it belongs, you know, mm -hmm. the patterns. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. I've also heard the comment that um, folks that have been trained in OG 
have a really tough time with this program <laughs> because it's a it's a complete shift in our in our training in our thinking. Um, mm -hmm. So everything backwards from the way you've done it before. You know? Exactly. Once once you get past the simple CVC level where you've been building words, and I think that's where everybody all, all these all these methods sort of share that. But so many of them leave the sound to print approach once the words get more complicated. It's true. And and when you get into that, those complications, that's where phonographics does everything backwards from what, what um, we've traditionally done. So it's quite a challenge for a teacher, I think, to make that shift in thinking. It takes some time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I'm anxious to learn more because it's, you know, that's my training too. So um, <laughs> what was the other question? Some people are asking about, um, they wanna know if this book gets into multi-syllable words. It does. Yeah. There's a whole chapter on multi-syllable. And um, if anybody wants to see, you could hang around and I could show you that quick video of the multi-syllable word building, if you'd like. Okay. And then we have, um, let's see, a question about the training and the certification. How long is the training and is there a certification um, process? Mm -hmm. So the training, uh, we offer an online course so that that's available to individuals and anybody anywhere. Um, some staff will, um, will like to train a, a lot of people at once. So they um, will have someone become a licensed trainer with us and then they can do their own training um, there at the, at, at the site. Um, but I think for most of you, it would be the online course that you'd be looking at. And that course is done self-paced. So you, you uh, log on and log off, you do, what you have time for. And I think people typically report about 25 to 30 hours on the course. And that yeah. is designed to teach you how to do tier one, tier two, tier three, any age of student. Okay. Um, is there a second book that follows up with advanced phonics and morphology? No, I would love to see that though. Wouldn't that be great? I, I think that- There you um, go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I've got a lot of things on my plate, but that's one of them <laughs> at some point. There you go. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's a question. Relying on memory and guessing to determine which spelling of a particular sound is the accepted one is rather hit or miss. In my experience, the teacher in the video literally said, do you have a guess? Mm-hmm. I do. This is where we have to encourage students sometimes to take a bit of a stretch. Um, spelling is an interesting thing. It's, although it, it is in many ways the converse of, of decoding, encoding is, there, there are quite some challenges to it for English because of our variation and we have so many ways to spell each sound. Mm -hmm. So it really, really does come after reading. It comes um, your, your ability to recognize those accepted spellings is going to be dependent upon um, the proper exposure to print, right? Where you're actually looking at sounds and sound pictures within the words. So some students came to us with a whole bunch of print exposure, but it was not good exposure, right? Nothing that's going to be helpful for them. So it's almost like it has to restart now. And we train them to look at words and to pay attention to the, the spellings as they're, as they're reading. So a lot of the lessons that you, know, you may not have seen are going to be continuing to train that, especially at the multi-syllable level. And you will find that spelling is going to take um, longer, of course, to come together than, than reading will. But the, the methodology is training students to rely on that receptive memory and not to try to memorize 20,000 spoken words, right? And their spellings. Mm -hmm. Instead to get a process for spelling that mimics what the natural process that spellers do, good spellers. All right, uh, I'm gonna have one more here because it's getting late. And the question is, you report having districts that use the program, what data do you have about impact and plans to publish? Mm. Yeah, that's been a challenge. Um, I took over the methodology from the developers back in 2014. And the challenge has been that all of our practitioners are independent. 
So um, although they, they get certified by us, then they, they go off and they don't have to, you know, they don't have to report back to us in any way. And so the McGinnises hadn't put anything in place to gather data regularly. And so that is a, another thing on my plate that um, I'm, I'm trying to work on so that we can get data coming in and shared better that with be people. Great. Yeah, yeah, definitely needed. Okay, so we have a request to see the final video. Um, so mm -hmm. folks, you can stay on to watch or you can have dinner. <laughs> you do. Thank All you, right. everyone, for, for coming. I appreciate you taking the time to look at this, and I hope you'll join us for the book study. Yep. And thank you, Donna, again for inviting me. You're welcome. You're okay. welcome. And I'll, and I'll put that on and um, yeah, put it on. And yep, let me find it again. Some words that are longer words they're more than one mouthful of sounds these words are two chunks of sounds the word increase is in crease we say it in two little pieces and the trick is to listen to the first chunk and write it sounds not worry about the rest and then when you're ready move on to the next chunk so let's practice that what's the first chunk you hear in the word increase in in great so let's build in. What's the first sound you hear in in? I can't my right now. No. What's the first sound you hear in in? Beautiful. Now what's the next chunk you hear? I need to do that again. In. Increase. Beautiful. Increase. Increase. Good. Now, why don't you map that out? Okay. Say the sounds and listen and write what you timid about jumping into water <laughs> last year not anymore no, what? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so what are the chunks oh, of sounds that you hear in the word timid oh with a chunk Tim and those will timid. work great yeah those will work great wait there's another thing right another way you could chunk it yeah don't don't write it now wait. We're going to build it. We just have to figure out okay. which chunks we're going to build. So we oh, can build we Tim. Both of them. Okay. Let's start with Tim, Tim. and Id, like Tim. you said. Okay. So what's the first sound you hear? In Tim. T I N Tim Id Timid. Great. Let's read those chunks now. Tim Id Timid. Now you could say this word in different chunks. You could say, what do you think? Do you know any other chunks that you could say this word? Timid. That's a little too much. I would take less than this chunk. Timid. Those could work too, those chunks. Make that be the chunks you just said. Timid. Great. Let's read your chunks. Timid. Timid. Mm -hmm. Which way do you like better for um, saying it? What's, what's easier for you to say? So let's read it that way. Timid. Timid. Good, and you can map it out that way. Let's hear those sounds. Timid. Timid. Any chunks? Timid. Timid. Great. Now, so that was just a quick introduction to the multisyllable level. And there, of course, yeah, my, heart, there. My, my heart was racing when I saw the TI open syllable. Uh huh. I, I know. Say, Ty. So I put that on there for you, <laughs> OG people. <laughs> I have, I am just having a real hard time wrapping my head around this. 
Mm -hmm. Well, think about the word linen. Mm -hmm. Linen is an open syllable, isn't it? Linen, linen. I say linen, L-I-N. Linen. Right, but some of us say li nin, li nin, li just the way we speak, right? We speak when we speak in chunks where we're quite um, fluid between them. Sometimes we put um, the consonant in the first chunk, right. sometimes we put in the second one. So we're starting from what the student walks in the door saying, and we're teaching them how to get to the print from there. Right? Ah, that makes sense. Good. I won't say any more and I don't want to confuse anybody. Speech to print. Speech to print. And at some point you're going to find with those open and closed syllable rules, you're going to find exceptions. Am I right? Of course. Yep. And what is the student going to have to do with that exception? Flex the vowel. Right. So we just teach them to flex the vowel from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's much more direct and much less to, to know and think about, right? much less that we have to teach a student who's maybe got language learning issues, right? Right. Uh, or, or a very young student who doesn't have much, you know, doesn't know what a vowel is. Do you have to teach them what a vowel is to then teach them to read? No, we can teach them in a much more fluid and natural way. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that you, you couldn't, after they've done phonographics and learned to read and to write, then go on and teach them about open and closed syllables and the tendencies there so if you want to. Mm -hmm. They're going to be set up now to be able to benefit from that instruction. Hmm. So interesting. Um, all right, well, I'm ready for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna thank everyone for coming. Erin, excellent presentation. Um, if, if you folks want to sign up for the book study, it's uh, scienceofreadinginfo.com under the events tab. It's $10 um, because it's a longer study. So, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that everyone, and if you sign up, you will get the recordings every week. So that's the deal of signing up. Um, that's about it. And let, you know, call it a night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you, everybody. Alrighty.